Welcome everybody, it's Senate Education for, for September 1st, and we are still meeting remotely uh, via the COVID emergency. Today we have um, two different issues. The first having to do with pre-K during the emergency and um, essentially labor shortages and things we might do to alleviate that um, as well as related topics. And then we have some representatives from outright Vermont who would like to speak with us about uh, cuts that have been proposed by the administration in their funding. And uh, outright Vermont is um, maybe crosses several jurisdictional boundaries, uh, but we have always had them into Senate education. And I'm interested to hear what they have to say about their funding. Um, just a heads up on that, and I'll reiterate this later, but we obviously are not a committee with a checkbook. So what we, what we tend to do is make recommendations either for good or for ill and uh, pass those up to the appropriations committee. And that's what I imagine happening in this situation. Okay, with that said, I'd like to go to um, Bill Yates, if I could who is the data administrator, district testing coordinator at Hartford School District. And this meeting began with an email that he sent to Senator Allison Clarkson, who contacted me and uh, she and I discussed it briefly. And we thought that the situation Mr. Yates was pointing to was worth looking into. And he had some coherent suggestions about how those might be handled. So what I've tried to do is ask a couple of parties from the pre-K world here today, Allie Richards and Meg Baker, to see if uh, they can respond to the situation in general, but also the suggestions that Mr. Yates was putting forward. So Mr. Yates, welcome. And uh, feel free to start wherever you like um, and with the idea that you would dovetail eventually with your suggestions. Well, thank you for this opportunity to, to speak with you all. I mean, I come at this issue from a couple different perspectives. One, most importantly, as a parent of a preschool student, um, also as a uh, school board member of um, uh, Windsor Southeast Supervisory Union and a da the data administrator for the Hartford School District, which is, in, as you realize, it is in Hartford, Vermont, and that really affects um, the towns that I am on a school board on, which is Windsor and West Windsor, because Windsor and West Windsor have very few preschool seats within their borders. Um, most students go out of those towns to go to preschool. And one of the areas is, of course, White River Junction, um, and which, which is part of Hartford. What has happened in the preschool that my son goes to is that uh, the preschool teacher, um, which I'm sure has happened throughout Vermont, is a retired teacher. Um, when the public pre-K law Act 166 was passed, it created um, opportunities for retired teachers to uh, continue teaching in a limited 10 hour week setting at private preschools. Many of these retired teachers are, as you understand, are, are at risk of um, COVID-19. And this a uh, woman who I actually know, I taught both of her sons in fifth grade in Pomfret, Vermont, um, and both of them are in their 30s. So you can imagine this woman's age, and rightfully so, her family doesn't want her to go to this pre-K, um, which is Aurora Daycare, and, and teach her required 10 hours a week for Aurora to offer pre-K kindergarten. The area also contains uh, Green Mountain Daycare, which they have lost their uh, pre-K teacher as well. Uh, Green Mountain um, is the largest daycare pre private pre-K within the area. Um, 
and they can't find someone to replace that. Uh, this happened um, at the beginning of, um, of the COVID last March. They, they lost their pre-K teacher. Thus, they lose all their town funding from the area towns um, for pre-K instructions, the Act 166 funds. Um, and what, of course, has happened at the Hartford School District um, that, that, that the public preschools don't have the room. They, they, they don't have the seats to absorb these students, plus the fact that many of these parents, like myself, um, find it difficult to function within the, pri the public preschool option because most of them, other than um, I believe Dotham Brook at Hartford, don't have a daycare uh, portion to their preschool. And so this really affects um, you know, working parents um, because it's next to impossible to, to, to find a position in which there is pre-K and daycare in Vermont. I'm, I'm trying to fix that. Um, in my position as a school board member, but it's a it's a long process. Do you um, mean, some of the uh, solution? If if I could just clarify, by the, the when you say they don't have a daycare option, you mean that they have limited hours, and you're looking for a an eight hour full full work day option? Yes, most public preschool options, not the private, the public, most of them are uh, either in the morning or in the afternoon. Um, some schools like Dothanbrook is uh, where I am actually based at is a good example because they um, provide a room for Green Mountain Daycare to um, provide a daycare for those students who are not within their preschool school class within Dothanbrook. Um, as I understand it from in this area, th there are very few schools that provide that option. Um, thus, many parents have chosen to send their children to um, private pre-Ks that provide uh, the daycare option as well. So the need to transport is not there and you know your students at a safe place. The option for my son, for example, he has gone to Aurora since he was uh, three months old. Um, so continuing with him there uh, was just the logical option. Um, his daycare is roughly a mile and a half from the school that I work in and I, I love the facility. Now, prequel is Preschool is not an option, it, it, and it's really not an option for me to find someplace else to send them, because really there isn't any place else. Um, because preschool teachers are at a premium right now. Teachers in general are at a premium, premium right now. Uh, finding replacement teachers uh, within Vermont is next to impossible. Um, some of the two of the suggestions I made. Um, we're in the letter. One other option has come up, and uh, I will. You, if you would, um, I'm the only one, or maybe one other person has read the letter. Could you just detail those suggestions for people? Sure. Um, the first suggestions I made was to require um, home school districts to include. Um, pre-kindergarten pre students um, who attend private facilities to be able to participate in that school's remote learning opportunities um, at the preschools that they attend to. Um, one issue with this is that I know at Hartford, um, there is no remote only school options for preschool students. So residents of Hartford would find that very difficult to um, make happen. Um, the other option was to allow for private preschools to um, apply for a waiver from requiring a certified teacher if they get a um, 
LIS system or LIL system um, to provide the curriculum during COVID. And the uh, um, one suggestion I made was a site that I looked at and got quotes for as well, is uh, MissHumblebees.com. Um, there is a third option, which has popped up in discussion for Aurora in particular, um, is to allow a waiver for in-person instruction um, for teachers to do remote instructions, the certified teachers to do remote instructions while students are at the private pre-Ks. And this option would actually work for Aurora Daycare because the teacher who is certified uh, is willing to do remote learning while the students are in the pre-K pre and supervised by uh, preschool staff. Um, but the, 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 um, the uh, owner of the preschool was informed that to get a, the preschool funding, that they would have to have in-person instruction. Um, if during COVID-19, if the AOE approved and allowed for remote instruction, all of those teachers that um, the students know would be able to teach from home face-to-face uh, -face with, with technology and the students would be supervised and also instructed by the preschool staff. This third option that I didn't include in my letter because I hadn't thought of it and I wasn't sure how the teacher I knew would feel about it. This third option really is the most um, effective for students in instruction because they, the teachers that would be doing the remote instructions know the students. Also, it would be the most cost efficient because no external software would have to be purchased. And um, also, you know, the students would be supervised by the preschool staff who are watching them anyway. Um, all that would, ha would be required was, would be for the AOE to allow for remote instructions from certified teachers to happen. The other two options are, of course, um, possible, but after I've done some investigations, very few school districts in the area are offering remote public preschool to preschool students um, because those students are at home um, and the supervision that they have is very limited. And you know, remote learning for, for preschool students is not a logical you know, if it's a computer and a student, these students don't have the skills, they don't have the attention span, they don't have any of that. While if the remote option was available, let's use the, my sons, the Aurora as an example, you know, they could use the preschool funding they would receive to continue to hire the music teacher that they did, to continue to hire the part-time PE teacher that they did, that who would actually come in, they would be able to continue to hire the uh, classroom teacher to do remote face-to-face -face learning with the students, which is really what her model was anyway. She would work with students one-on-one -on -one and um, the uh, daycare worker would be doing a group activity with the rest. So that's, that, that's kind of the issue that we're dealing with. Um, and in general, the state of Vermont is, is really struggling to get preschool teachers anyway. COVID has just dried up the pool completely. Well, um, there's, a, there's been a longstanding issue with, um, you know, the, the required teacher in the private practices because we've had testimony for years that they can't get enough, that there's, a, that there's an economy of scarcity, especially in the kingdom and um, rural parts of the state. So I imagine COVID has exacerbated that to the point where people are just throwing up their hands. So um, 
Mr. Yates, that's that's a great summary of the problem and some solutions. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll turn to the the two other witnesses. If it occur something else occurs to you as we go forward, we can certainly come back to you. But um, if I could go to Allie Richards now, uh, welcome Allie. And, and um, Allie, if you wouldn't mind speaking to the extent possible to the uh, you know, factual parameters of this problem so far as you know them. In other words, how many teachers are we missing? Uh, do you have any metrics around how bad this shortage is? Uh, and then what are your thoughts on solutions? And maybe we can limit it for now to everything being conditioned on the emergency with the idea that if we did something, it would go away when the emergency went away, as have all of our other temporary fixes. Um, right. So uh, start wherever you like. All right, thank you for that prompt. Uh, I will probably change my remarks a little bit, um, although I did submit written remarks uh, that might be helpful as a resource for you all. Um, but I'll, I'll do a more summarized version and, and really interesting to hear from you, Bill, as well. And for the record, Allie Richards, CEO of Let's Her Kids. Thanks for having me in on this. So. Um, you know, let me start with your question, um, Senator Bruth. We knew before the pandemic we needed 2,000 additional early educators to the point the bill is making to actually meet the need of, of zero to five. Okay, so just to give you some context, uh, we do have some numbers. You know, recently, for example, there's a, I mean, they're they're anecdotal. There's uh, here and there, but they all add up to what you're probably hearing. There is unbelievable, tremendous pressure right now um, with the loss of early educators um, for a variety of reasons. One, it was dire before. Two. $13 an hour, no benefits. Three, you know, right now you need more staffing to get this done in a difficult environment. You know, you need substitutes galore, which they're hard to come by. So we see programs closing because of the staffing shortage. It is really severe. So this is, I just want to be sure we're all on the same page. This is really a moment right now uh, where an acute um, pressure has just gotten even more acute somehow. Um, for another thing, the hubs coming on board for the school age childcare. The sign on bonuses and other things are going to potentially pull from this field or just frankly show the injustice, you know, in such a detrimental way that it's just hard to go on. These folks have been working, you know, a serious burnout um, since March in some cases for the low wage, you know, with no benefits. And now they're seeing others make more money um, than they are and, and they could be making more money in literally any other job. So there's a serious problem. So you, you asked that question early on. I just have to lay that out. You know, we saw one job site that has 72 listings for uh, openings of childcare um, right now. Um, we have the right in Montpelier, uh, where you'd usually be meeting right now up the street is um, one center that has five openings they cannot fill. So they've had to reduce their hours. They, they did do some data um, from CDD recently. 33% of all programs said they changed their hours or days of operation because they didn't have enough staff. So this is a widespread problem. Also, 49% um, of the regulated childcare programs said that they um, uh, change their hours or day because of COVID. So this is very much a COVID related, um, staffing related shortage. So um, that's some context for you. Uh, let me get back to sort of the pre-K specifics. I'll finish quickly with the, the broader context here of this, what the staffing shortage means. Um, you know, I just have to acknowledge unbelievable work happening by early educators, licensed teachers, you know, especially last spring, we saw some unbelievably creative, awe-inspiring work happening to remotely support families in a really tough environment. Um, so, you know, in this case, I would say we really do think that um, this is a shortage that Bill laid out beautifully. I don't need to go into the details specifically to the pre-K um, complications, but we would say that um, if you could temporarily, as you mentioned, Senator, um, with the lens of not moving backwards on quality standards, right? This is a temporary emergency. So making some creative flexibility um, right in this moment to get us through this, but to not bake those into the long term, you know, that's the wrong direction. Um, but to have a waiver, for example, for pre-qualified pre-K programs who lose their licensed teacher, 
the way that Bill has said, and they're unable to hire replacements in a timely fashion. Um, you know, we really appreciate that AOE shifted policy to actually allow requests for additional days for substitutes for licensed teachers. Programs are now allowed to apply for an additional 45 days. So we recommend also allowing programs that are pre-qualified as of September 1st, 2020, to receive a waiver to continue to use the substitute for the duration of the whole academic year. Um, again, temporary only, but these fixes of waivers with substitutes and, and other pre-qualification statuses really, really would help. I know Meg Baker is speaking next, so I want to really yield most of my time to her because she can tell you how this all looks on the ground much better than I can, Senator. Um, but I do, you know, really want to say that um, there are flexible there are there's flexibility needed right now to get us through this moment and bill laid it out perfectly i think meg can give you those details i couched it because of your question in the long the bigger picture staffing shortage terms and i just wanted to keep you guys in the loop because of this really crisis moment we're seeing right now with um you know 500 spaces in chittenden county alone in the last two months closing because of staffing mostly um this is this is very serious so we were asked to come up with a solution um in the moment and other committees right now are actually hearing about it um and so i wanted to keep you all in the loop and i'm happy to come back at a different time if that makes more sense because i definitely don't want to take from meg's time but um we suggested a one-time 500 dollars wage retention um incentive retention recruitment incentive for those who've been working in this field you know tirelessly without any sort of extra uh wage supports um as a way to really say thank you and to comp and to compare it a little bit make it more equitable to these um hub folks that are coming on board and to try to stop the loss right now so that works kind of in conjunction with flexibility specifically to the pre-k piece as well i wanted to be sure you knew that was happening pretty much simultaneously it's new as of a couple days ago it's responding to a real need and it's a uh, flying through the process Process, I would say right now and other committees, just so you're aware of that. So any qu specific questions I didn't cover, Senator, but I'm trying to keep it yeah. high level. Uh, I, I think I understood what you said um, about those programs that had pre-qualified by September 1st, you support giving a waiver for the rest of the year. Um, how about the waiver for allowing licensed teachers um, in private programs what's what's your thoughts on that again yeah i would say if a program is pre-qualified yeah a private program is a pre-qualified pre-k but they've lost their licensed teacher to maintain their pre-qualification status okay. uh, through a waiver okay um but if they are not pre-qualified um by september 1st mm -hmm. so it seems like we would develop pretty quickly two subsets um, a program might um, not have been pre-qualified, but want to move on without a licensed teacher. Um, would you support them not having a licensed teacher for the emergency? If it's the licensed teacher that is the the singular factor, because we know it's just it's true shortage now, um, and there are other supports in place, I would say yes. I mean, I'm you know I'm pushing on the creative, flexible part here. There are other parts of pre qualification that are crucial, as is the licensed teacher. I want to be clear, mm -hmm. this is it's crucial, crucial, crucial. We do not want to slip backwards on this. Yeah. However, like this is an acute moment. So I would say, yeah, this is really, um, there's a real dire moment here where families are gonna lose access to publicly you know, funded pre-K right now. And um, so I would say, if the licensed teacher is the key factor, flexibility there okay. would be huge. So um, before we hear from Meg, and I see that Senator Perchlick has a question, um, inevitably this will come to language. Um, Jim Demaray is watching us via YouTube. Um, so Jim, if you're listening, uh, so far it seems as though the idea of a, an emergency specific waiver for programs that had pre-qualified by September 1 to continue as pre-qualified through the end of the year uh, and then a waiver if a program has every other aspect of pre-qualification except for the licensed teacher um, during the emergency. Does that sound about right, uh, Bill and Allie? I'd love to hear from, from Meg, especially on the latter um, Absol piece. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm just, I, <laughs> okay. I don't no. want to um, have mm -hmm. to go back and 
remember and recapture. So I'm, I'm not saying that we would move forward with that language, but just so Jim understands to the moment what we're discussing. Um, Allie? That seems, yes, that seems accurate. Okay, uh, then let's go to Meg. Um, Meg, nice to have you here. Oh, I'm sorry, Hi. Andy. Uh, Senator Perchlick has a question. I could also ask it after Meg. It's about the- That's the, okay, go ahead. So it seems like there's two things that Ali was just talking about is there's the requirement that there's a licensed teacher for 10 hours of the week offering instruction or helping with instruction in the building. But I think I heard Ali talking about another waiver for the substitute teachers. And I wanted to clarify those two different rules. Um, I heard talk about making two different waivers temporarily. Isn't that right, Allie? That's right. I don't know if the, honestly, uh, this is probably a question for, for Jim and others. I don't know if the first waiver is en enough of an umbrella that it, you know, mitigates the need for the substitute one, but the two that we specifically um, were drilling down on, um, and it's in my written testimony, is the one is the waiver to, you know, if you are pre-qualified by September 1st to maintain that, but the second one is to um, extend the substitute. So in other words, programs pre-qualified to you use a waiver for the substitute for the duration of the year. So I don't know, and I'd be curious, I mean, maybe Kate or others also um, have a better sense of the technicalities of that. I don't know if you would need to um, really uh, list the specifics of both the license teacher waiver and the substitute waiver, or if the first one covers the second. But I do think you're right to say there are two th dynamics here, which is license teacher and the other is the utilization of substitutes. The other, um, before we go to Meg, um, Jim, if you're listening, I'd, I'd also be interested to know to what extent these changes can be made just as policy, uh, emergency policy decisions on the part of AOE um, and to what extent we would actually need to write session law or um, something to get us through. Uh, so your thoughts on that would be appreciated as well. Um, Meg Baker. Um, Hi, thanks. Um, so I um, wanna thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify a little bit about the impact um, that coronavirus has brought to pre-K programs. I'm the universal pre-K coordinator for Addison County, uh, which is three school districts, uh, Addison Central School District in uh, the Middlebury area, Addison Northwest in the Virgins area, and the Mount Abe um, Unified uh, uh, School District in the Bristol area. And this year we are partnering with um, approximately, it's still a running number, 31 uh, private pre-K program. Meg, I think we lost you. You're frozen, Meg, so maybe yeah, a quick, quick fix might be to turn your video off. Okay, is that better? That's, your image is still frozen. So maybe let's, yeah, there we go. So let's okay. try just audio. Okay, all right, sorry about that. Um, so where, where did you lose me? Uh, We've got three I, school districts, 31 yeah, private you, partners. That was that's where you were. 31. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, and last year we had about 430 pre-K children and 80% of those children were served in our private pre-K programs. I'm anticipating that approximately a same percentage will be served this year in private programming. Uh, mm -hmm. But coronavirus has definitely brought changes to both our public school programming and the private pre-K programming. Both programs are having huge shifts right now in fall enrollment. Um, a lot of families are still working on trying to decide what their needs are for pre preschool programming and what their comfort levels with sending children back into those group environments are. So we are seeing a lot of children who are either dropping uh, or not enrolling. So countywide, I've had 34 children 
withdraw from pre-K in the last two months. And that's just the four-year-olds who would be coming back. It doesn't include the three-year-olds who never enrolled to begin with. Um, I'm anticipating that we'll see 20 to 25% fewer pre-K children altogether enrolled this year as opposed to last year. We are seeing uh, in both district programming and private programming a shortage of staff as well. Um, the, that's in part the barriers include personal and household health uh, and safety concerns, as well as childcare for uh, school age children who may be attending a hybrid model. Um, so those are the barriers we're seeing. There's a significant shortage for, of substitutes both for schools and private programming. And we may see some temporary isolated classroom closures because of that. We've had several programs that have had to be creative with their staffing, um, either allowing children to come to work. So we've got a number of programs that have gotten a variance so that staff children are able to come to work with their parents. Uh, they've also offered more flexible scheduling for their staff. Um, we have a program that is has a teacher who is doing kind of a combination of outdoor door only um, and uh, virtual on site, but virtual learning for the children in the classroom. Um, we've got uh, reduced hours in several locations as well. Um, but I'm not seeing the difficulty with retaining licensed teachers. Um, overall, I'm seeing that it's, it's uh, teachers want to come back when the crisis is over, but at the moment they are experiencing barriers to come back. Um, there are some programs around the state that have closed. Uh, UVM uh, Campus Children's School and Kinder Start were two of our former partners and they've both closed. And the financial impacts of COVID on all of these programs that have operated on very shoestring budgets have been huge. Uh, they've had drops of enrollment, they've got increased supply needs, they are having to budget for communication tools to meet with their staff and families, and a number of them are experiencing changes in space. So they're renovating so that they have space to do the health checks or greater space for children. They're moving their learning outdoors, and so they are um, getting more tents or equipment for outdoors. Um, changing furniture setups, all of those kinds of things. Most of our full-time programs are also reducing their hours because they need extra time to clean adequately. Um, and uh, they need additional staff for both greeting, saying greeting children and, and at departure um, because of the health checks. Um, there are some grants that have helped support those programs, uh, but certainly programs uh, have don't always have the energy and staff time to devote to applying for those. So pre-K funding has been a huge help to them. Um, our district pre-K programs this fall are offering about 10 hours of uh, in-person learning for their pre-K students in a hybrid model. So two days a week mostly. And there's one school in our district that's also offering a 100% remote option for families. I think for a couple of families most of our private pre-K programs are already back in session or are planning to be back in session when school starts. So they'll be fully in person. There are some pre-K programs, private programs that are also offering families a 100% remote option for those for the children. Uh, and most of those, those kids are in individual situations where their families have a medical concern that doesn't allow that child to safely return. And we are paying pre-K dollars and the guidance from the AOE does support paying pre-K dollars for children who are getting a 100% remote option. Um, we offered some professional development this fall for both our public and private pre-K um, partners on um, remote learning, which I should say is not really best practice in this age group because uh, of the relationships that are and the hands-on learning that's necessary to really provide a, a strong education. But we know that that may be a requirement. Um, last spring, our pre-K programs, the private programs, even though it was not required, 
formed incredible learning opportunities remotely with their families. They provided them with physical supports. They drove out to deliver diapers and food. They delivered packets of learning activities. Um, there were mailings that happened. There were lots of virtual opportunities. And I have no doubt that if we have to close again, that they will be able to support families again in, in a remote context. Um, just in response a little bit to uh, some of the things that I heard from Allie and Bill, um, I 100% agree with Allie that staffing uh, has been a long-standing issue in the early childhood field. Uh, I could probably talk for a long time about why that might be, but it, pay and benefits are a big part of that. Um, I would also say that in terms of what I see with the waiver, um, I think that there would be some benefit to providing pre -K, private pre-K programs with a waiver to remain pre-qualified if they were pre-qualified last school year. So I don't know about the September 1st date. I might go with a May 31st, 2019 date, you know, before the end of the last school year. Um, and I wouldn't recommend, I don't think, a waiver for new programs to become pre-qualified if they don't have a licensed teacher. And primarily the reason for that is that I think that would open the doors to a large number of programs that have never been pre-qualified before and that it would be confusing for programs and for families why it might be acceptable for one year and not in the future for them to not have a licensed teacher on staff. Um, so I would say if we if we shifted the, the language from September 1st to May 31st, uh, that would probably cover all the programs that were pre-qualified last school year um, without necessarily opening the doors to a whole host of others. And then one last thing while I've got your attention. Uh, I know there's been a lot of conversation around the 175 school uh, days in for K through 12. And I would just note that pre K programming is meant to run for 35 weeks, uh, which is is uh, 35 five day school days uh, would be 175 days. So if you shorten the school year for K through 12, if you could also please remember pre K, that would be fabulous. And I'll, I'll cede any leftover time I may have. Senator, may I just uh, say, clarify, I guess, my hesitancy on your question. Meg, Meg got right to the heart of it, which was what we're trying to say is, you know, in this temporary moment, this leniency, this flexibility is necessary. But having the experience of, of doing pre-K in the past is the key factor because you've had the, the pedagogy is in place. You have sort of the experience of the instruction that's, that's likely to still be there, you know, even if you don't have access to that licensed teacher, you know, in, in the moment. That's sort of the basis of what what my hesitancy, hesitancy was to your question. So Meg really addressed that, just if that helps you get the, the dates as you're sorting that through. Is it possible for me to make a, ask a question of Meg? Sure. I assume that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Meg, that great presentation. I agree with you 100%. Um, what is your feeling on um, my my most expansive uh, option of allowing certified teachers to teach from home while the students are in their private pre-K being supervised by daycare um, um, workers. So I would say in terms of the two proposals I heard from you, the first one that I heard was, um, was allowing teachers to teach remotely. Um, and then the other piece that I heard was allowing children to join public pre-K classrooms that are operating remotely. Um, so the, the, in terms of the joining the public pre-K programs, I'll tackle that one first. I would just say our districts don't have capacity um, and, and that forming new relationships with children virtually um, to teach them is, is going to be ineffective. Um, and you know, in terms of the preschool age group. The other, in terms of um, having kids taught remotely by a licensed teacher, 
My gut says that there are ways to do that well, but that having a remote teacher leading a circle time, for example, is not going to be as effective as having time for that remote teacher to work with the other staff to engage the children in hands-on learning and um, remote instruction. So if there was a, a remote teacher who was designing curriculum, I would say yes, but I wouldn't necessarily say that a remote teacher is going to be able to deliver direct instruction well. No, yeah, Meg, I, I do agree with you. I, I, I've been an, I was an elementary educator for 23 years um, and um, mostly in uh, grades four through six. Uh, but you're absolutely right. My idea of allowing um, a licensed teacher to teach remotely would primarily be that she would be supervising the other staff, possibly talking with a student one-on-one -on -one for a short period of time because she, um, this particular teacher I'm thinking of has a relationship. And I think it would be good for that student to check in with that student with with their teacher on occasion but you're absolutely right it's it's the it's the it's the staff on the ground so to speak that would be doing most of the instruction but i i, I thank you for your your insight uh thank both of you i i'd like to turn to kate rogers if i could from aoe um Ms. Rogers, you've heard the discussion and um, I raised at least one question, which Jim has answered. He, he believes we would need to make uh, a statutory change around waiving the licensed teacher during the emergency, but thoughts on any of this wherever you'd like to jump in. <laughs> Thank you. This was... Um... An incredible conversation, really. I'm sorry, Kate Rogers, Agency of Education. I am the early education manager and I oversee universal pre K and early childhood special education, as well as early multi tiered systems of supports for the agency. Um, again, this has been a, an incredible conversation. I love hearing um, about possible solutions um, to each of these dilemmas, which we all face. And again, this is new for everyone trying to figure things out in order to support our, our, our children and their families to access um, pre-kindergarten education and as well as childcare opportunities. I do wanna point out that um, um, with, with Allie's um, discussion on um, the staffing shortages with childcare and slots, um, um, programs closing, it is um, a crisis situation. Absolutely. But I also want to point out that the childcare, even though we have about 270 childcare programs who are pre-qualified private pre-K programs, um, so they support that within their settings. Um, we talk about early childhood educators kind of like all in one bucket when um, to me, and coming out of education, an early childhood educator means, uh, for pre-K purposes, a licensed um, educator endorsed out of the agency of education with their early childhood education or their early childhood special education endorsements. So, um, so I do want to kind of, it's, you know, we're trying to solve the same problem, but we have um, different ways to move about it and different requirements. Um, regarding that. As you know, the Agency of Education and the Agency of Human Services Child Development Division jointly oversee um, universal pre-K. So we connect with them um, weekly, even daily sometimes, about the operationalizing and monitoring of these programs. Um, so right now we have about 400 programs who are pre-qualified, both public and private, and we have about 40 um, applications for pre-qualification in our queue, waiting on approvals. So if a legislative um, um, 
if you move to you push a you know a waiver for for teaching staff um, for uh, it has to be I, I agree it has to be something um, in the legislation um, that does that um, we can't do that at the agency um, but I do agree with the point that it should honor those programs who were already part of a pre-K system. Those new, no, um, because they haven't had the opportunity to implement um, pre-K education um, and have that licensed teacher on board, um, either on site um, in public pre-K programs doing direct instruction or, or on site and being present in private pre-K programs. Um, to oversee instruction. So we've got some nuances of, and differences in what that might look like. Um, when, I, when I first came on, I prepared um, to um, provide some comments based on uh, Mr. Yates's um, letter that he provided uh, with um, pulling out and identifying the problems that he was facing and he knows other families are facing within his region um, as well as, as coming up with some possible solutions. So I think Ms., uh, Mr. Yates said some of those solutions um, we may have um, res resolved um, in the best way we could at the state level. So we have recently released guidance um, on August 21st. Um, the first guidance was on the allowable use of public, publicly funded pre-K education dollars in response to um, COVID situation. And that outlines um, what private, private pre-K programs uh, may do in terms of offering families remote distance learning or hybrid model of instruction for those pre-K students who are enrolled um, in their private programs. And districts, school districts, of course, pay public tuition dollars for each of those families um, so the child can attend and receive the public education. So, um, so that guidance outlines that, that um, the private programs can continue to receive public pre-K dollars um, if they do offer remote or distance learning. So I think that piece um, is clear in that guidance. And that's also, um, it also states in, an, in another um, additional guidance, and I'll post these for you, um, Jeannie, I can put them um, in the chat box where the links are to these guidance, guidance documents for, for the committee members. Um, additional guidance we put on, on staff qualifications and the instructional, instructional models uh, that um, are impacted by COVID. And this allows programs to, again, offer that remote distance or hybrid um, instruction to families um, who choose to, to take that option of remote um, instruction. Um, so nothing's off the table. We're in step two of uh, um, Agency of Education's school-based strong and, and healthy start to get us going. Um, so we, we framed it within the steps of uh, the strong and healthy start guidance. Um, within this, this same guidance, a licensed educator um, needs to implement the remote learning instruction and align the curriculum with our Vermont Early Learning Standards. And we are stressing the use of the Vermont Early Standards developing self um, domains, which, which incorporates the social emotional um, um, pieces um, to support educators and families on securing um, best practice in order to support those families and children um, with social emotional concerns. And that's before any type of academic, and I'm using air quotes for that, academic instruction in, uh, occurs. So we wanna make sure everyone is safe um, and healthy and uh, their needs are being responded to um, as they move forward with whatever type of learning the families have chosen um, than them to do. So um, in terms of losing a licensed teacher, um, pre-K programs um, are required actually to inform the agency of education if they've lost a licensed educator. Um, we have an accountability and continuous improvement system that we um, um, 
closed down um, during March through July. Um, we've ramped that back up um, because um, we know that all programs must comply with Act 166 and, and the, the state pre-K rules. And um, part of that process, um, and this would also inform um, programs um, if a waiver does come through, it would have to be that a waiver also um, takes into consideration if a program is in uh, like a tier one, tier two, or in intensive needs um, that may be in uh, jeopardy of, of having their pre-qualification status revoked. So there's different pieces I think that come into play um, if you are thinking about providing a waiver um, for programs um, to waive their the te licensed teacher expectation um, that Act 166 outlines. Um, the substitute teacher, um, it, it's always been a, a piece that there may be a substitute teacher um, that can be in place for 30 days. Um, Ali um, referred to that um, the agency has provided an additional 45 days um, given COVID, maybe a licensed teacher um, has, has become ill um, and the program is looking um, to either hire or replace um, that licensed educator. This gives them up to 75 school district days to hire or contract with a licensed educator. So that's half the year um, in terms of what that waiver will provide um, a school or, and, or a private program. Other solutions um, for keeping, maintaining, and finding um, a licensed educator uh, would be involve having an emergency license issued or provisional license issued um, for uh, an individual, individual who um, would like to be the pre-K teacher within a private and or public uh, pre-K program. Um, so there, there are these alternatives and, and um, systematic pieces in place at the moment. Um, Ms. Rogers? Yes. If I could just ask for clarification on one of Mr. Yates' suggestions. Sure. So he was talking about um, not, not necessarily waiving the requirement for the licensed teacher altogether, but waiving the piece where they have to be on site mm -hmm. uh, so that they could provide uh, input remotely, whether it's working one-on-one -on -one with a kid or designing curriculum with staff. Your thoughts on that? Right, and, and that is part of our um, pre-K staff qualifications guidance. That, okay. is, that is a possibility. Um, given Currently? For, yep, yep okay. that's in the August 21st guidance that okay. if a remote option, it could be that, um, and let me look at the language here. I have it pulled up and I'll post these for you so you have them at the ready. Um, oops, maybe I have the wrong one up. Senator Bruce. Well, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. Sorry, my, my daughter's music is competing with the hearing. Um, <laughs> uh, did you have a question, Andy? Well, I, was, I thought while she was looking at it up, Meg in the chat said she had wanted to ask a clarifying question. So. Oh, uh, please go ahead, Meg. Thanks. Um, Kate, you mentioned that in terms of uh, other pieces that a program could take advantage of in order for to find a licensed teacher, emergency and provisional licenses were an option. But my yeah. understanding is that emergency and provisional licenses can only be granted by the superintendents. Yeah. And since yeah. the superintendents don't directly supervise staff and private programs, I believe that in most of the state, they've said that unless you work for the school district, they're not able to offer provisional or emergency licenses to 
staff in private programs. Can you speak to that at all? Sure. Um, the provisionals and emergencies must be um, um, an application for that must come in from the superintendent. And it is at their discretion. Um, if they help to support a private partnering um, pre-K program um, with their um, application for um, a provisional for their teacher to get a provisional. Um, so why superintendents um, may be reluctant to do this is because that if that individual um, doesn't fulfill um, the, the teaching requirements within that program, the um, consequences fall back on the superintendent. Um, and so that's why they um, may be reluctant um, to provide that. Some do, however, um, provide that for um, private pre-K programs. So maybe that's a, a something that needs to be um, explored a little deeper um, through statute or um, the pre-K rules itself um, or the licensing uh, educator rules too. So. Yeah. Well, this is, I mean, I'm not telling anybody anything they don't already know, but it's been a long-standing point of friction between private providers and public school districts um, on this issue and also on the um, pre-K, what I'll call the pre-K establishment uh, that is often synced with the public schools. Um, we had long, long hearings when we were trying to reduce the double oversight between the two different agencies. And we had a lot of private providers come in and their, their main complaint was this licensed teacher requirement. Um, they just found it problematic in every way, shape and form. Um, so it doesn't surprise me that the problem is still with us. Um, I realized when I look over the agenda today that we didn't have any uh, people who run private providers in to testify on this and we should rectify that. Um, is there anything else you'd like to tell us, uh, Ms. Rogers? Um, just again, when I was preparing um, um, for Mr. Yates' um, comments, um, Mr. Yates, you did suggest that um, a program might access uh, online curriculum um, to support the remote um, learning. And um, this is one piece that um, we did define remote distance um, and hybrid learning within the guidance um, that we have just issued. Um, we do know, and, and you, 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 you said it yourself, that um, hours in front of a computer is not appropriate, of course, for our three, four-year-old student, kindergarten, first, second grade students, of course. Um, but the curriculum as part of Act 166 must align with the Vermont Early Learning Standards. And the Vermont Early Learning Standards also align with RTS Gold. It's our Child Progress Monitoring Assessment that we require um, pre-K programs um, to report on twice a, twice a year um, in their checkpoints data. So um, I, I do appreciate um, you doing a little bit of, of research there and, and sharing with us Mrs. Humblebee's Academy. Um, but there are, are other requirements that go along with that in order to have high quality pre-K education for, for our, our young students. Oh, Thank Senator, you. Senator oh. Sorry, I'm trying to shield you from loud Elton John, which has somehow made it back into teen pop music. Well, at least she has good taste. <laughs> <laughs> um, so given that we've heard all the testimony at this point, questions for Ms. Rogers or any of the witnesses? Yeah, Senator Perchley. Yeah, for, for any of them, what I'm hearing from some of the private providers in my district is also that they're having trouble with some of the regulations just hiring the lead teachers. You know, so it's not that they need to have the state license for the 10 hours for the pre-K, but for the childcare, 
that some of the requirements there are getting because it's just so hard to find any like like was mentioned they put a ad out for five positions and they get zero applications so on top of that with the low wage to say that they need to take spend money to take courses and things like that is is making it difficult i don't know if there's been any discussion my question is has there been any discussion on waivers of those other requirements temporarily I think you that's just a, quickly. Oh, okay. Oh, go ahead. I was thinking maybe AOE was the place to go for that. Well, I, I'm just curious because it's actually on the CDD side. So please, Kate oh. or Meg, if you have feelings on that, please. I was just going to mention this is a, a CDD regulation. Um, Kate, do you want to go ahead? No, oh, that's right. It is um, the lead teachers are uh, defined in the child care licensing regulations and not in the pre K rules. And I would just then add to that, that um, to, to your question, Senator, uh, yes, the answer is not, not as far as is there a blanket waiver that might be thought of like this as we're approaching you know, start date of a pre-K academic year with licensed teachers. It's a little bit more of a fluid situation. So our understanding from the field is, is CDD is being quite lenient with waivers on a case-by-case -case basis. So I would I really recommend your local folks to call the licensor on duty and discuss that. I know everybody's really, really trying to understand what's happening on the ground and get us through this moment. Okay, thank you. I will say it's, it's uh, good to hear that one of Mr. Yates' suggestions now seems to be possible under, and I, and I think Mr. Yates, correct me if I'm wrong, it was the possibility that you thought might be most efficient, that is allowing the licensed teacher to um, contribute virtually. From what I understood, that is allowed under the current guidance. Um, any thoughts on that? Um, I'd be interested to uh, read the, um, the August 31st update on, on that regulation, just sort of to, to clarify it. But if, it, if it's possible, I, I, I think it's wonderful because it would allow these three to four year olds to um, continue at least in some way with the instruction, the, the instructor that is f they are familiar with and are familiar with them. Um, and um, yeah, if, if, if that's possible, I, I, I think it's great. I think it would allow a lot of the uh, uh, licensed teachers who are um, left the classroom because of COVID to be able to still do their job. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I can't remember who said it. Um, it might have been Meg. It might have been um, someone else that it's not so much an issue that um, we've lost or, or need to find many more uh, certified teachers. It's more that those teachers are unable to participate and are anxious to return after, after COVID. Mm -hmm. I think that sort of speaks highly for this opportunity for teachers to teach remotely with students who are in an organized classroom. Okay, I think that's a great um, thrashing out of the issue. And I think there is one piece that it seems like we had agreement on, I believe, from all the parties, and that would be the waiver for pre-qualification, assuming that a, a program was pre-qualified by May 31st um, around the substitutes. Is, is that, am I right in that? Was that, Ali, what you were suggesting and what Meg agreed on with the friendly amendment of March 31st, or I'm sorry, May 31st? I believe that was on the bigger picture of if you were qualified, pre-qualified, yeah. you have a, a waiver beyond just the substitute. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so we'll have a look at that. Um, Jim is taking notes and he'll come back to us with something on that. I'll send it around to everybody. I will, um, just so you know, I will try to have a private provider or two in to talk as well uh, because we, we need to cover everybody. But at this point, I'd like to switch to Outright Vermont. Um, and Dana Kaplan, I think, can kick it off for us. This is around the 
$40,000 cut proposed in the governor's recommend um, and Mara Iverson is here as well. So welcome to both of you. We've got about 22 minutes left. Uh, consider that your time and tell us what we need to know. Great, thank you all so much. Um, I have prepared a couple of remarks and I'm gonna go through and read that for you. Um, and then we are happy to answer any questions that might help in understanding where we are in this current picture with the proposed cut. So for the record, my name is Dana Kaplan. I use he and him pronouns and I am Outright Vermont's executive director joined by director of education, Mara Iverson. We're here today with a clear ask. Please recommend full restoration of the $60,000 legislative appropriation to Outright so that we can continue to build safer schools for everyone and so that LGBTQ youth across Vermont have a chance to live. Let me be blunt, the stakes are that high. Over the past many years, Outright has worked hard to move from scrappy to mighty, knowing that the needs of our communities across Vermont were too dire to be anything but resourced and available for them. Through tireless advocacy efforts at the State House and by building relationships with individuals, corporations, and foundations, we've made sure our financial footing is strong so as to be well positioned to meet the needs of Vermont youth and youth facing professionals statewide. Our overall FY 20 budget, we follow a calendar year for our education program is $163,469. That's direct costs that allow us not just to execute trainings, but to be ready and able to provide resources for educators year round. So a $40,000 cut to that budget money, we were told as of July to count on is nearly 25%. That would be detrimental to our services. We've budgeted our costs, expanded programs, and applied for other foundation money based on our understanding of this state funding being secure. It will be many months before some of those opportunities arise for us again as a nonprofit organization. $60,000 covers most of what it costs to have one educator on our team and one person providing these services amounts to hundreds of resourced adults, schools, and youth. And I'll talk a little bit more about that impact in a minute. We have conversely seen just how much it costs a district when they fail to meet the needs of their students. Just last year, Burlington was sued by the Department of Justice for failing to provide affirming treatment of trans students. Do you know what they're mandated to do now? district-wide training with Mara Iverson. Without this money, we lose our stable ground. And as the only entity in this state providing specific training, consultation, resource development, and support programs to LGBTQ youth, educators, and administrators, when I say we, I mean Vermont, we must remain steady and available to the people we serve. We know firsthand the desperation that teachers and administrators feel when they don't have the knowledge or skills to support their students. We also hear time and again, just how relieved and successful they are when they do. Study after study has shown that the best way a government can spend money is on education. It is the highest rate of return in the long run. For years, our relationship with the Agency of Education has been pivotal. As we've approached new organizations to invest in expanding our work in Vermont schools, they've seen the state support as an endorsement of the vitality and relevance of what our evidence-based programs do. In addition, this funding has provided a solid base from which other individuals and private contributions see how they can complete our funding picture. And while we have worked hard to diversify our funding streams, COVID has certainly created some additional challenges. We've already seen the impact of the economic crisis on our revenue streams and are unable to rely on the level of contributions in a year over year comparison. For example, our first of two fundraisers that we do annually when we moved online this year saw a 60% decrease compared to 2019. At a time when the pandemic reveals the depths of our reliance on schools and educators 
to do so much more than teach. And though our schools are burdened by the extra costs of operating safely in the COVID world, we cannot afford to take a short-sighted approach here. We must continue to invest in teacher training, school supports, and programs that set us up for brighter days ahead. Outright is a pivotal part of this constellation. While educators and administrators are trying to get up to speed on how to teach in this new world, we are here and at the ready to provide useful suggestions coping strategies and curriculum enhancements today. In 2019, our work spanned all 14 counties, 104 towns, and that's those that we know of, it's likely higher given certain districts like U32 serve multiple towns. And we are now working with a network of 83 gender and sexuality alliances in schools. Those are extracurricular groups that support LGBTQ and allied students in their local communities. We trained 1,341 youth, 2,674 adults, and provided a total of 111 trainings and workshops, or 250 hours in actual training and workshop delivery time. Mind you, that does not include prep, scheduling, or follow-up, so that's a very low number. All of these are instances that are providing youth and adults opportunities to see bright futures that are possible. In other words, a critical and hopeful counter narrative to what they typically see and feel in conversations that we have about LGBTQ youth and adults. Let me turn for a quick moment to provide a refresh of how we got to this point where we are right now with this appropriation. In 2019, we came before you to share the very real need for schools across Vermont to better support LGBTQ youth. You acted with care and dedication for some of our most vulnerable youth by recommending a $60,000 appropriation to the AOE base as a pass-through grant to outright, expressly for the purpose of funding this work to create safer schools. That the AOE would attempt to cut this relatively small for them amount of funding that directly supports the sustainability of these efforts through funding the salary of a director of education is beyond disheartening and honestly scary. I know you have all seen the YRBS data. Those numbers are real youth. Those are real lived experiences of kids in our schools who are suffering, isolated in remote towns, living with rejecting family members, being bullied in their classes, left out of their curriculum. They're ultimately navigating poor health outcomes across every risk category that we know of based on having, it, having to navigate a world, and in our case, a state, that is still largely unaccepting and oftentimes violent and hateful towards them. I'd like to just speak to a quick few points that I've heard the Secretary of Education make over the last week or so. This $60,000 appropriation is not an anomaly and to paint it at such is downright inaccurate. You can see a slice of the picture when you look at the PDF of the Agency of Education's payments and specifically the agreement amounts to us over the years starting in 2013. The chart ends in 2019, uh, or your FY20, does not depict the $60,000 legislative appropriation that we got at that time, but what you can see is funding that has increased from $20,000 to $37,000 to $60,000. And this was the AOE being responsible to the needs of school district based on their feedback and advocacy saying they were desperate for more trainings, more resources, more curriculum development, more consultation time so that they could boost their capacity to support struggling kids. Secretary French shared that the rationale to cut this money is essentially to spread the pain around if we apply an equitable lens to how we look at budget changes, that makes no sense. LGBTQ youth cannot tolerate any more pain. It is a death sentence we do not want any part of. And what kind of message does that send to queer and trans youth who are already struggling in schools? In Vermont, we lead. And in the past, we have done so with the Agency of Education by our side trailblazing with the authoring of a best practices guide for supporting trans students in schools, including gender identity and our anti-discrimination laws, other states look to us. But right now with this proposed cut, 
and no other plans in the works to support schools around LGBTQ competence, I'm not seeing the Vermont we need to be. Calling out this money from the base is dangerous and it puts youth at further risk of failing at the hands of our education system. Protective factors are supportive adults and peers, not having to bear the burden of being the one to educate your class on how to use your correct name and pronouns, but getting to be an active participant in school, sports, clubs, classes. It is about belonging and belonging is suicide prevention. With no backup or alternative plan for this life-saving services, it means that the cut is not just a cut to outright, it's a cut to LGBTQ support work in schools, period, and that is not something we can afford. If there's any silver lining to this wretched pandemic, it's that more of us see how our fates are intertwined. I thank you all very much for your consideration of recommending a full restoration of these funds so that we can all get back to the necessary work that is ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dana. Um, Mara, would you like to add or uh, did that express your feelings as well? I mean, Dana killed it. That was really awesome, <laughs> John Dana. <laughs> And I would like to remind you that the current statistic that we're looking at for the suicide rate for LGBT youth in the state of Vermont is one in five of our LGBT youth in a year makes a suicide attempt. One fifth of our students. And if you're looking at a number that's around um, anywhere from 12 to 14,000, one in five is thousands of kids a year that make a suicide attempt. This isn't it isn't for play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both. Um, the committee has been supportive of your requests in the past. I, I won't speak for them now, but if I were predicting, I would say that's where we would wind up. Um, I, I, I will suggest that we wait until next time when Senator Hardy is here. Um, we're going to have to begin as a committee a process of um, putting together different requests around CRF funding. I want to uh, recommend to the committee and then hopefully to the Senate that we increase the 6.5 million we put into the HVAC program, um, given the success efficiency of Vermont has had in signing up 300 schools for work. Um, so what I'm imagining is one communication to appropriations that would be, um, you know, this is a regular budget item, um, not coming out of CRF or ESSER funds, but we can have different sections of the letter and add to them as we go and then finalize it. We don't want to wait too long because in another two weeks, they're going to be working through their requests pretty quickly. Any questions for outright, uh, Senator Ingram? Thank you. Um, well, mostly I just really want, um, want to make a comment, I, a couple of comments. I know Senator Hardy was a very sorry not to be able to be here um, today and she's uh, you know, very, very supportive. And she was, it was actually her idea to, to invite you um, today. So um, just to convey that from her. Uh, and then also as, you know, as one of the three LGBTQ senators, um, I just want to thank you very much for your your work, and um, you know I I am well aware of uh, you know we're not playing around uh, when we're talking about uh, young people and um, finding their their place in the world and um, um, being able to to manage and uh, also the the incredibly important. Um, resource that you provide to um, to teachers and to to adults uh, in their lives um, to help them to, to understand better. So I thank you for your work, and um, um, I don't mind saying that I will certainly do everything I can to to make sure that your your funding is is restored. It's really a drop in the bucket um, in a billion dollar uh, AOE uh, budget, and. Um, yeah, there, it seems to me there's no reason why we, we can't get, get your funding back. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Well, thank you very much, folks, for joining us. Uh, committee, um, what I'm thinking for Thursday is Jim Demaray has prepared language around Dan French's policy proposals that he went over with us last time. It turns out that the House is putting forward a very similar document. So we'll take a look at that on Thursday. We won't look to vote on it or move it. What we'll do is go through it, note uh, places in the language where we wanna make changes, what we seem to support as a committee, what we don't. And then we'll wait for the House to deliver us what they're gonna send but at that point, we'll be ready to act on it very quickly. Um, so that's the heads up for Thursday. Anything else before we head out? Senator Ingram. Thank you. Um, yeah, I did just want to bring up um, in um, testimony that uh, Senate Health and Welfare heard this morning about the, um, the hubs and uh, the child care hubs. And uh, yeah, sorry, yes. <laughs> I think we're all done with you, Dana and Mara. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dana. Uh, about the child care hubs, um, we, uh, we heard also from Holly Morehouse about um, after school, uh, the after school programs are very much involved you know, in that. Um, and she mentioned a couple of times S-335 um, that we had. Task force? Um, yeah, the task force. And um, so I uh, just wanted to uh, say that we kind of uh, told her we would try to check into that. I guess it's in house ed um, right now. And um, um, if you don't mind, I know I'd be happy to reach out to um, some of our colleagues in the house and uh, see where, if it's on their radar or you know, if they have any intention of passing it before we- Sure, I, I, I think that would be fine if you wanna do that. Um, I did, and I believe Kate uh, Webb CC'd you on it, Debbie. She did mention maybe a month ago that they might be interested in working on that. I suspect what's going on there is the House version of the tax and regulate bill now directs uh, a chunk of the proceeds into after school. And so given that that's the House's stance, it may be that that's trickled to the Ed Committee and people have said, hey, didn't you have a, uh, a bill setting up a task force? Um, so sure, if you want to do that, um, you know, I just, I, I've kind of lost hope for the house acting in any predictable manner on anything that we've done. Um, I, I honestly, I just don't understand what they do with their time because they seem uninterested in moving legislation. And I can't see that they do much in the way of oversight either. So it's, uh, I don't know. So with that said, probably better that you go speak to them than, than that I do. Um, so yeah. Andy Holly was just pointing out, sorry, Holly was just pointing out that, you know, yeah. short-term problem now, but we, if we want to get ahead of our, you know, long-term yeah. needs, we, re we really need this, this task force. So, yes. But, will, but, for, <laughs> but for instance, let's just take this task force. We sent it to them, you know, six months ago, seven months ago. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just a task force. It's, it's not policy. Um, and they could have, you know, I know they support after school, so I just, I, I just don't get it. But I, again, they're, they're locked onto something that I can't see. Um, so I think that's everything. Andy, you didn't have a question, did you? I just wanted a, a quick question on the school ventilation program, if there was anything else to do on that, or just as kind of a hold, hold to see if there's gonna be any funding or do we wanna hear from them or is that really not needed if? Well, what I'd, what I'd like to do is, um, so as we've talked about a lot in here, there's a hundred million dollars supposedly fenced off for pre-K out of the, the CRF money. So it, it doesn't look like 
the hole in the ed fund is going to be more than 70 million. So even if we were allowed to move that money into the ed fund, there's a chunk of money there that I would, I would be willing to fight for uh, in terms of our needs, K through 12. With that said, um, you know, adding, we have 6.5 million approved now. Um, you know, if I went to Jane Kitchell and said we were interested in adding three and a half million for an even 10 or 5 million or um, some 5.5 to bring us to 12, I'll, I'll just gauge her reaction. Um, if she seems open to that, I'll bring it back to the committee. Um, and no one has expressed any opposition to increasing the funding. Anybody um, feel like that would be a problem for them? Okay, so I'll assume since that was our policy proposal, it's been very successful so far. You know, one way to look at it is we should be directing as much money into that program as we can because what it's gonna do is get rid of our deferred maintenance and save property taxes in the long run. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if we could put 20 million into it, I'd be all for it. So I'll talk with uh, Senator Kitchell and report back. Um, I'll try to do that by Thursday. Jim? I would uh, suggest doubling the money from six and a half million. Let's go for another six and a half. Yeah. And uh, double or nothing, right? Let's. Uh, yeah, I mean, if. if uh, I would have liked to see more money up front to begin with, but it is what it is. Well, um, originally, uh, Senator Kitchell offered 12 million, um, which I will remind her of. And we, we you know, negotiated with ourselves down to <laughs> six and a half based on what we thought was a hmm. good reading of the available workforce. But it seems like those problems aren't cropping up. And there's a, there's a clawback anyway in November, if it doesn't look like it can be contracted and finished by December 31st. So, you know, putting more money in, it's, it's not gone forever. If it doesn't get spent by the right moment, we still have a month to move it into some other, other place. So let me have that discussion. We'll start work on a memo in terms of funding priorities for the committee, and we'll we'll keep working on uh, Secretary French's policy pieces. I'm thinking this little piece around pre-K we could drop into that miscellaneous um, because it's also COVID related. Okay, everybody, thanks very much. See you Thursday at 2.30, if not before. I guess I will see you on the floor tomorrow. See you tomorrow at 1. Yeah. All right. See you guys.